profession. This Saturday, 21st November 2020 at 3 p.m., the Directorate of Industrial Training will hold a live talk show on NTV under the theme, Sensitization of the Public on Vocational Skilling. Because of technology, this audience is not small <coughs> because we are right now actually live uh, on NTV and I urge all the young people outside there and all people that work with young people and all people that have interest <coughs> dealing with young people to please tune in NTV and watch and please find a way that you can participate and make, this, uh, make the most of this gathering. I don't want to say too much. I only want to wish you uh, all the best and a very nice uh, deliberation. And thank you very much to Makere University for always being willing to host and to be, you know, and for always being willing to be, you know, there for issues affecting our young people's sexuality. I don't want to say so much. Let me give you back to the program managers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Robert Ochaya. Um, so our panelists, just a quick introduction of our panelists. Um, we have Professor Osu Joachim. He's the Dean School of Medical Sciences, Amherst International University, Kenya. So if you could just raise your hand just so that we could, the audience can see you. Um, we have Judith Nalukwago, the 85th Vice Guild President, Macquarie University. We have Alega John Bosco, the Dean Institute of Public Health and Management, Clark International University. Um, we have Peace Musimenta, uh, a lecturer, Doctor of Philosophy in Gender Studies, School of Gender and Women's Studies, Macquarie University. Um, we have James Chizito, Deputy Dean of Students, YMCA Comprehensive Institute, Wandegea and Buwambo Campus. We have um, Samson Udoho, Midwifery and Women's Health Lecturer, Department of Nursing and Midwifery, Faculty of Health Sciences, Lira University, Uganda. We have Martha Mugabe, a student of doing a Bachelor of Social Sciences in first year at Macquarie University. And last but not least, Masika Masi Mastula, third year student, bachelor's nursing, bachelor's nursing science, Uganda Christian University. Thank you so much all for being here. So um, yes, we are live on NTV. Everyone who has tuned in, we are glad that you're with us. Everyone who is streaming live via Zoom and all other social media platforms, thank you for joining in. Uh, we are the Inter-University Dialogue 2020. And just to remind you that we are, you can follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag IUDUG20. Okay, um, we, just to move on to our program, we're going to have a keynote address uh, from Dr. Kenneth Wienza. I don't know if he's ready. He's the Clinical Services Manager, Reproductive Health Uganda. Uh, he's, going to be, he's going to give us a keynote address. I don't know if he's ready. Dr. Kenneth, please. Thank you very much, Daisy. Dr. Kenneth has just walked in, and we are privileged to have him. Dr. Buyinza will talk about COVID-19 and sexual reproductive health and rights 
in higher institutions, navigating uncertainties. Dr. Buyinza, actually, you're live on TV as we speak, on NTV, and you're just in time. Dr. Buyinza is the clinical services manager at Uganda and has been leading the response team for that organization in regard to COVID-19. Doctor, you're most welcome, right away. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, to all our dear uh, panelists and uh, the entire audience at large, uh, as well as our viewers and the other uh, social media platforms. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's always a, a pleasure to be part of events such as this one. Uh, as you've already heard, my name is uh, Dr. Kenneth Wienza Wafla. I work with the Reproductive Health Uganda as the uh, clinical services manager, but I also uh, support the Reproductive Health Uganda Anti-COVID uh, Emergency Response Task Force. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure, honor, and a privilege uh, to be joining this uh, audience as we discuss a critical but often less considered priority as we navigate the uncertainties surrounding sexual and reproductive health and rights in the higher institutions of learning and especially in the wake of COVID-19. At a personal level, <clears throat> This event and day at this institution awakens memories of days 20 years ago when I walked into the gates of a similar institution as a freshman. Then we would be introduced to new academic life and oriented to all sectors and units of the universities, which would be our new home for the next three to five years, depending on which program one chose to pursue. But such major academic transition came with the untold realities. A transition from the close watch and farm protection by the parents and schools to a more liberal and independent life that for many of us students would suddenly place decision making on critical and personal social life issues into our own but naive hands. <clears throat> To over half of the students, such transition would actually be an induction into real adult life, a borderless social life characterized with the first time and or non-restrictive sexual relationships, both on and off campus, unfortunately, which a majority of us and many other affected colleagues were ill-prepared for. Sexual relationships would actually pass for that single area of study on which students were their own teachers. A course unit without a defined course outline. Each participating individual would have to learn from their different experiences, some of which were happy, others were subtle, while others sustained very bitter tests. And as we crept from one semester and academic year to another, Stories of pregnancies among university students, abortions, ill health associated with disease, including sexually transmitted diseases and HIV, mental health issues resulting from substance abuse, dead years, and total school dropout became abound. And at least, if my memory serves me all right, at least two horrendous incidents in which some two students unfortunately had to rot their way to death after induced abortions went bad. Indeed, young people in high institutions of learning in Uganda and elsewhere in many developing countries encounter numerous challenges in relation to their sexual and reproductive health and rights. Deprived of appropriate information and life skills, many transition into high risk sexual life, which lends some of them to traps of disease, unwanted pregnancies, unsafe abortions, and associated complications, 
and in some cases, total failure to realize the academic objectives as some of them will drop out of schools. Access to information and on sexual health is still a luxury in most Ugandan tertiary institutions and universities. And access to sexual and reproductive health services and commodities that would confer protection and hence a safe sexual life is still limited. Ladies and gentlemen, it is therefore heart trending that young people and especially young women in Uganda have to suffer preventable illnesses, injuries, and sometimes death as a consequence of sexuality. Studies estimate that at least 25% of adolescent girls in Uganda have already entered motherhood, making Uganda's teenage pregnancy one of the highest rates in Africa. Unfortunately, approximately 20% of such pregnancies end up in induced abortions. As one study once reported, close to 300,000 induced abortions occur in Uganda each year, with about 51% of them ending up with complications many of which do not even seek or access treatment. In some instances, unsafe abortions occur when these young women are left with no other alternative but to take matters into their own hands. Self-administering so, uh, toxic substances and invasive objects that result in either grave injury and disability and sometimes death which contributes to as much as 26% of all maternal deaths occurring in the motherland Uganda. And the fact that communities, societies, and stakeholders at various levels across the country can sit aside and look on as numerous young, energetic, and, pro and productive people perish through such deplorable but completely preventable circumstances is disgraceful. Actually, today, progress in knowledge and technology has led to several advances that span economic, commercial, agricultural, and medical fields, to name just a few areas that have seen advances in human development. The exception, however, to such progress is found in young people, and especially young women's access to reproductive health and rights. It goes without mention that it is only in issues related to reproductive health and rights, and particularly where only young people are affected, that religious, moral, and cultural attitudes continue to be invoked to prevent actions that would save and improve the lives of young people. Unfortunately, it is the very mindset in society that is not ready to accept sexuality education for young people support and promote safe sex practices, including contraception, all of which are scientifically proven avenues to prevent unplanned and unintended sex, unwanted pregnancy, and disease. It is also the same mindset that would be wholly opposed to health interventions and other social empowerment initiatives for young people who suffer the consequences of STDs, unwanted pregnancies, leading to unsafe abortion, injury, and sometimes death. The above situation is further compounded by the existing policy environment, in which case Uganda's policies on SRHR for adolescents and youth, and especially those in higher institutions of learning, are either unclear, confusing, and sometimes contradictory. Although the government of Uganda has made tremendous efforts to put in place several policy provisions, as well as actions to address young people's health needs, including the Uganda National Health Policy, the National Strategy to End Child Marriage and Teenage Pregnancy, Adolescent Health Policy Guidelines and Service Standards, HIV AIDS Strategic Plans and the related initiatives, the One Dollar Initiative, and to some, what seems to be the controversial National Framework on Sexuality Education in Uganda, among others, many of these frameworks remain unachieved as some of them are still in draft, others are contested, while most are unfunded and therefore non-operational for years. 
this situation curtails the extent to which young people, and especially those in institutions of learning, can be supported and empowered to realize their sexual and reproductive health needs and rights. But if we as stakeholders ever buried our heads in sand on SRH issues of young people, the COVID-19 crisis, and particularly the resulting nationwide lockdown and its ramifications on the SRH of young people, have not only exposed systemic challenges and gaps in SRH service delivery, but also underscored the urgent need for effective and inclusive adolescent and youth SRH empowerment policies and programs. Although the actual impact of COVID-19 on SRH is yet to be quantified, but anecdotal evidence points to the possibility that there is a spike in teenage pregnancy, a challenge that Uganda still grapples with. For the first time, I must say, we may be arriving at a consensus that without a proper and inclusive SRH support mechanism, young people in Uganda can even be, find themselves even more unsafe and vulnerable in the backyards of their own homesteads and in the hands of their own parents and guardians. As learners in candidate classes and final, year, uh, final years of high schools of learning return to, to school, we have already witnessed learners, parents, and school parents, schools, and governments equally disparate for interventions that would enable pregnant girls to resettle back in school. And ladies and gentlemen, it is again a such background that for a country like Uganda, whose population is predominantly young and economically dependent, achievement of Vision 2040, as well as the SDGs and other development plans cannot happen without deliberately investing and supporting implementation of holistic and inclusive programs that empower young people to take full control over their lives and make safe, safe, safe choices about their SRH as one of the important avenues towards reaping the demographic dividend. Indeed, Uganda will not attain the desired goal on universal health access without laying down and implementing mechanisms that address the myriad of challenges faced by the young people in regard to their SRH needs and rights. As I conclude, many studies have shown that young people's access to services and their increased, and increased rights in making safe, sex, safe sexual and reproductive choices, including effective contraception, leads to better health, not only for the individuals themselves, but the entire population as well. More satisfactory reproductive health outcomes and less morbidity and mortality related to unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortions. Accordingly, the values, attitudes, and morals of our societies and institutions must change now and make the young people and women, their well-being and health, a center of discussion and action. This is the only way we can contribute to strengthening and empowering young people and women to improve their reproductive health and realize their fullest potentials as equal beings. I therefore pray today, I pray that today's dialogue will be open about the plight of young people and try to put a human face on the uncomfortable SRH statistics for young people and this country at large, and to exemplify the obstacles young people in higher academic institutions face in accessing both information and services for their SRHR. Henceforth, on behalf of Reproductive Health Uganda, the International Planned Parenthood Federation family, the entire SRH fraternity, and the young people from whom we all evolve and serve, seek to persuade all stakeholders here and beyond to uphold human rights obligations and act urgently to reduce the numbers of preventable injustices, injuries, and deaths resulting from disease and unsafe abortions due to unavailable and or inaccessible SRH information and services including birth control services for our young population. And in the wake of disruptive crises like COVID-19, it is even more urgent to enforce appropriate standards and policies to ensure improved sexual and reproductive health and rights of our young people and women. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the only way we can talk about a sustainable way forward. Thank you so much.
you so much, uh, Dr. Kenneth Buyinza. Um, for those of you who have just joined us, uh, both physically and on NTV, as well as virtually via Zoom and the different social media platforms, welcome to the Inter-University Dialogue 2020. Um, right now, we're going to have um, a few remarks from Mr. Henry Semakula on behalf of the Ministry of Education. Um, Mr. Henry Samakula, you're welcome. Yes. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I request that I remove my mask since I'm a little distanced from you. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Director of Basic and Secondary Education, Alhaji Indwa who was invited to officiate at this function, but he has been unable. So he told me to come in as a dangerous substitute. I want to say hello to all of you and welcome you to this inter-university dialogue. And I want to inform you that government is always committed to such dialogues because there's quite a number of issues to dialogue on. And wherever dialogue is done, consensus is normally reached. Ministry of Education in particular is in charge of quite a big number of young people we learned from the lockdown that about over 15 million were sent home and they have been home and they have been going through several challenges including those of a reproductive health nature and so we know that dialoguing over those issues is very important we are very glad that the organizers of this particular um, dialogue took concern of the people who matter as far as this discussion is concerned when we saw their invitation we saw young people we saw people living with special needs we saw UN family, we saw civil society, other line ministries, and so on. But most importantly, we saw invitation also being extended to religious, cultural, and political leaders. And many times when we are discussing issues around health, we think the cultural leaders may have nothing to do. Yet many times when you also go out to explore what is causing the so many health challenges, they really have a big hand. Either them, or the cultures, or the norms, or the rituals, have a big do to the issues that cause ill health to our people. The young people have had a number of challenges during this lockdown, which we all appreciate, and I know the people in the room need no further introduction to these issues. The teenage pregnancies are up, very scaringly. Before the lockdown, we are talking of a percentage of 25%. We don't know whether anybody has collected meaningful statistics yet, but we are sure it must have gone 25 already. Personally, I was in West Nile about two months ago, and in all the districts of West Nile, there's no district that had less than 300 young people, teenagers getting pregnant. When I even got into a camp called Obongi, I found more trouble there. These were refugees, and over two-thirds of the population that were, teenage, uh, were pregnant were actually teenagers. So the challenges have been many. Many have gotten married off, including university students. There are those who thought the lockdown would be very brief. So instead of actually going home in Bushenyi, they took cover somewhere around the Chikoni, around the Katwe. And what proceeded was an unholy marriage. What came from an unholy marriage was a lot of SGBV. But we are also aware that quite a number of them also became pregnant. Out of their real intention, the STIs are on the run, on the rise. Uh, all sorts of trouble, including defilement and rape and bad touches. So we know it has not only been happening to the young people, but also the people of your age. Why has all that gone bad that far? We thought as Minister of Education that when the parents are in charge, they are better handlers of the SRH issues. But we're also learning that it seems they cowardized. It seemed they thought it is that CSO to look after the sexual health of their daughter. It seems they thought it is that school, it is that senior woman, it is that senior man. That was very unfortunate. Some of the parents did do their part. Whereas some other parents who tried to do their part were not empowered enough. They didn't know what to say. And for the older, young people like you, my dear colleagues at the university, sometimes it is a little difficult for the parents because they think you know. For us at the ministry, we know that learning continues all the time. Even those of my age continue to learn. But some parents assumed you knew, so they didn't tell you anything, only to end up having cases of incest and so on and so forth. So all this has been happening. Now, we as Minister of Education really have the following questions answered at this dialogue. 
Do we give, should we give more information? What is it that we are not giving enough? Should we involve more players? The teachers have done their part. The religious leaders have done their part. Civil society has done their part. Who else is missing in this game to ensure that our young people are safer? Should we improve avenues for communication? Are you tired of listening to TV and radio and ask the elders? Are you also tired of social media because you know you're exchanging a lot of information there? Should we think of more? Are there any missing services that seem to be critical? Who is sleeping on duty? Because all of us must be doing some work. The parents, the young people themselves, the medical people, and so on. Are the young people concerned about their plight? Or it is us, the adults, who are struggling to ensure you are well off, but then you are not doing your part? Are they taking up their responsibilities? Because this is important. Many times we are heard asking for our rights. And as we ask for our rights, I know at this dialogue, we shall be reminded that rights go hand in hand with responsibilities. So are the young people playing their part in terms of responsibility? If those questions can be answered at this dialogue, then we as Minister of Education believe that we'll go a long way in supporting our young people, especially at the higher institutions of learning, in managing all those affairs affecting them. As a Minister of Education and Sports, I want to reiterate that we are very committed to the plight of our young people. We are not only interested in their academics and career, but we know that before they excel, they must be healthy, and therefore a discussion on their health equally concerns us. So I want to commit to doing whatever we can, as long as it is within our mandate, to ensure that young people all the way. There has been a challenge. A lot of concentration has been in primary and secondary, and the assumption was that the university students know what to do. But research coming in shows there's a lot of trouble. So we want to commit ourselves to supporting you as long as we keep within the mandate of the Ministry of Education and Sports. I want to thank you very much for listening to me, and I want to wish you a very, very wonderful dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Semakula. It's a pleasure to have you in our midst and to share an update from the Ministry of Education and Sports. How I wish that we had the minister herself and then would have even asked for bigger things but take our message that we are happy and following what the ministry is doing but we still have more that this panel is going to ask today as we get to the panel I want to thank uh, Dr. Vuyinza for that elaborate uh, presentation showing the extent to which already bad sexual reproductive health is in high institutions of learning and also now asking deeper questions on how we are able to respond given this pandemic. This pandemic found each of us in a very different way. Some people, one of my friends called that the university has been locked. The university has been locked. I want to go back home. What do I do? No, the thing is about to end. It's just a very short thing. Things will be cleared. Exactly like what Semakula mentioned. And eventually they didn't ever go back home and they will not even go back to school, unfortunately. There are so many of that. I want to ask the people on the panel, especially the students, what is your experience of COVID-19 lockdown? Where did it find you? The students and the students leaders on this panel. Please, this is yours, beginning with Martha. Where did COVID, the lockdown, find you? What is your experience? Uh, the COVID-19 found me at home. Please, use the mic. Use the microphone. It found me at home. Found you at home. What did you feel about it? What has happened in these so many months that you've been at home? At first, it wasn't easy because I wasn't used to staying at home. But with time, I got used. With time, you got used. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next one here. The COVID-19 found me home. Um, I was not, I don't think anyone was prepared for it. So you find that you are from school and then you are home. So you look at your mother and you start finding something to do out of the blue, like you want to get something new to do, but then you are locked in the house. So that was the situation for me. 
Yes, Judith, where did you find you? Um, on, on 18th March, when the president closed institutions of higher learning and schools, of course we were at school, but then we were told to go home because of what had happened, and uh, we went home. It was not an easy situation as we as students and our parents had to adapt to the situation that had been caused by COVID-19. But nevertheless, the first few months were, the first three months of the lockdown were troublesome. But with time, we learned to do so many other things in the lockdown. It came as a problem, but it was also an opportunity to us, especially us, the young people. So even if we preach the evils of the lockdown, there, is so many, there are so many things that we have done and learned during this lockdown. Okay, thank you. You sound to have taken it positive. I'll go back to our lecturers that are here. What challenges have come to you as lecturers from this lockdown? Beginning with Dr. Professor Peace. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Peace Musimenta, lecturer School of Women and Gender Studies, Makere University. Actually, the lockdown has enabled us to understand that we need to go back to the roots and train and equip our young people with skills to survive on their own, but also to protect themselves, uh, especially when, these, uh, when the lockdown started. The many, many of them were not prepared. And I remember some of them calling and asking, Madam, when are we going back to school? And I would say, um, yeah, my answer, uh, yo, yo, your anxiety is the same anxiety I'm experiencing. So I realized that we need a lot to train them to be on their own because they were not able, some of them were not prepared to do any housework, some of them were not prepared to think outside the box and survive without going to school and getting handouts from, uh, from the parents. You know, When you are uh, at home, usually parents support you when you're at school, they support you. But when you go back, like I have a, a son who is uh, 21, I forget that he really needs some air time. But when, when they are at school, they send and they ask and you send. So it, it is a bit, it was a challenge, both parents, both lecturers, and, and also the students. Yes, I'll go on with the other lecturers here. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Samson Udo from Lira University, and I lecture on midwifery and women's health. So I think that, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, COVID um, disrupted our way of life, you know, as, as lecturers. We are used to a routine. Every morning you have to, you know, you have your students and you have lectures to, to run, and it's uh, two to five every day. And um, with the lockdown and no students, first of all, we, we, we did. Ready? And uh, it was difficult to cope, knowing that, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning and you basically uh, you have your own business to run. No student uh, in your side and, and so on and so forth. But secondly, um, the, the other thing that has really been uh, quite an experience for us as lecturers is now the new readjustments that we have to make in terms of how we do the students. Formally, we are used to do We are moving to online. And Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. My name is uh, John Bosco Alege. I'm a senior lecturer and also dean, Institute of Public Health and Management at Clark International University. So when I reflect on the question you have just raised, it was an interesting experience because um, whereas we are used to the routine, as my colleague has said, uh, so 18 has found us on campus. Actually, we're conducting lectures. And uh, all of a sudden, there was no preparation. And so the question was, what next? As an administrator, uh, students began calling me. Are we going for one week? Are we going for one month? How long are you going to be home? And for me, my paradox is even more complex because I have international students that I needed to you know, take uh, care of in terms of 
what does that mean in terms of their hostels, what they will be doing for the, in the meantime as you wait for another uh, presidential directive. Now specifically in the context of what we are discussing today, uh, there was a real challenge. Challenge in terms of, um, remember a student is a dependent and probably when they are sending out a budget, especially the female students, I am sure they include um, some monies to take care of their you know, reproductive health needs while in college. But here we are now, all of a sudden, parents have, some parents have lost their jobs or they have been suspended from earnings and so there was no supply in terms of the regular pocket money and all that. And so they were really stuck in terms of accessing. But I also know that uh, because of the lockdown, uh, because of the directives, some of the facilities that were nearby where these ladies could go and access services were equally closed. And so there was a question of even if you wanted to access uh, sexual reproductive health services and products, you realize that you can't find them even within the, 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 the vicinity of your, of your hostel. So it was a real challenge. But as my colleagues have already said, over time, like all uh, we know now, it is the new normal, we started to adjust according to uh, the current context. I think for now, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the invite. My name is James Chizito, Dean YMCA Comprehensive Institute. I think the pandemic has really exposed us of, of how ill-prepared we were, not only the government, but even the social network. Uh, the social networks which have always kept our young safe in their environment. They have always been kept safe at school. And school has become a way of life. You wake up in the morning, and then you go to class, and it is the way of life they are living. Uh, all of a sudden, they are told to stay home. So they have to create a new way of life. And parents don't know how to, to do with that. What should they do? Even if you go back to the basics, that somebody has gone back to the village uh, many have never even tried farming or digging. So they have to be, uh, to be, to relearn how to live again in this air. And this really challenged many of them in all sorts of ways. Uh, and some have psychologically even been affected. So they need a lot of intervention at the moment uh, because of those effects. They have not only been affected economically, they have been affected socially, they have been affected politically, and in all ways of life. So it is really a challenge. Our systems are stretched. Our systems have always been ill-prepared. Uh, we therefore need to be uh, ready uh, most of the time, which was not the case at this moment. Thank you. Just to encourage you to speak into the microphone every time you speak. And if you could lower your mask so that you're more visible, I mean more audible, that's also okay. We have a professor also from Amref University in Kenya. I don't know if he's online. Would want to share his experience of what has happened at Amref University. Is he uh, online? Thank you very much. Um, I'm told the host has to allow my video to so that I'm seen so the host can allow my video, but I can be talking in the meantime. I hope I can be heard. Yes, we hear you. Yes, uh, so I'm based in Nairobi. I'm Professor Joachim Osur. Uh, I teach at the Amref International University, where I'm also the Dean of School of Medical Sciences. I'm also a researcher in issues of sexual health, and now COVID. And um, I'm also a service provider in the area of sexual and reproductive health. Uh, so in terms of experiences, it has been uh, very many mixed experiences. Um, of course, uh, we have had to change the way we are providing education under these circumstances. So we've gone virtual, we are doing virtual lectures, and um, in addition to that, we've had virtual examinations. Uh, what is becoming clear is that students who are uh, economically disadvantaged are no longer cope 
with the kind of education system we are adapting to. Because it requires one to have um, electronic gadgets, laptops, it requires them to have internet at home, and uh, so not many students are privileged uh, to have such. And so we are finding uh, a discrepancy in terms of access to education, uh, and uh, the more privileged uh, children or students have more access to education now than before. So some of our students have not been able to attend classes, some uh, have not been able to uh, sit exams, and so that is where we are with education. We hope that as time goes, uh, this will change uh, because we should be able to provide education to everyone. On the side of research, I've uh, done a lot um, just looking at the connection between COVID and sexuality, and a lot of worrying things are coming up. Uh, the girl child is at a serious risk at this time. Uh, we are, because the students are at home, they are spending more time in enclosed places, in communities. We are seeing a lot more sexual violence. We are seeing rape, we are seeing incest increasingly uh, among females. And we are also seeing other uh, practices like female genital mutilation going up. And we are seeing increased pregnancies. Okay. Do we still have you, Professor Joachim? I just um, wanted to ask you a lead question. Professor Joachim, if you hear me, I wanted to ask you a lead question. From the challenges that you've mentioned and the issues that are coming out in research, what do you think should be the basic key reforms that the education sector in East Africa and the whole of Africa should be looking at moving forward? I don't know if you can hear that. I can hear you very well. Yes, please. Yes, I think COVID response needs to be comprehensive. It is very important for us to respond to COVID and manage it well, but it needs to look at other aspects of life. We need to come up with strategies for protecting especially the girl child. And so when people go out to... We are struggling a bit with Professor, but I'll come back to the lecturers here. What reforms do you think as basic bare minimums should this COVID response enlighten us to? We could ask Professor off a bit. Yes, I'll go back to the gentleman from YMCA. Yes, thank you so much, moderator. Um, as I stated at the beginning, um, we need to do better preparation so that next time we are not caught off guard. What have we put in place? The side of the lecturers, we are adopting to technology, but it has equally been a very big challenge. That means there has been a gap in the way we have been doing things. Two, what about our students? Will they be able to get what we teach them so that we occupy them well? It is not easy in a third world country like this where many have been sent to villages. They cannot afford a laptop. They have no power. They are very far from the centers, the city center and the towns. So, it has to be an intervention which involves not only us, the Institute of Ireland, but beyond us. Government needs to come in and help to see that these services are provided at a relative price which is affordable to men. Thank you so much. Thank you. Samson, what's your take? Thank you, moderator. I think for me, one of the things we need now moving forward is change management. As we all will appreciate, we've learned something new in the last seven or so months. And to be specific, 
I, I, I am, we were among the few institutions that pioneered online learning way, way, way back before COVID. Which one is this? Uh, Clark Just to be sure. Clark International University. We actually started teaching online for the Master of Science in Public Health program way back in 2010. We started it online. And I remember very well we were challenged. How do you teach a program and people graduate, you know, when they are not physical here? And, but we continued. So when the lockdown was handed over, I mean, it was, 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 was given, it for us, we were now using those as a building block to start moving forward. We didn't have to start from the scratch. But specifically to your question, so what we need to do is everything seemed to be now moving digital. So if you were appreciating analog, now is the time for you to start blending both digital and analog approach to life. For instance, young people need to access RH services and products. Can we start talking about telehealth? If I'm in Gulu, I don't need to travel to Kampala to, buy, to come and buy you know, whatever services I need to access. I could actually talk to a service provider online using a cheaper platform, like my colleague is saying, that could actually be set up so that I can have a conversation with, uh, with, with, with the service provider without necessarily traveling. Because moving forward, I think that is where we are heading to. And the other one is that um, I know we may not go back to what we used to do, like traditional physical classes, traditional service delivery, and, and so on. So that means institutions, within their means, need to invest in infrastructure that will be, will be able to support uh, this kind of new normal. And of course, as you know, many institutions don't have the resources, and I am happy that we have a representative uh, from Ministry of Education. We need to partner in terms of moving forward. What is it that we need to do to be able to ease some of the barriers to accessing reproductive um, uh, health services, especially by young people in the context of a university setting? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll go to the Guild representative. What do you think the university can do different in this time when you're struggling to catch up with the lost time, but also with all these barriers in place. Thank you so much. I had not introduced myself earlier. I am Judith Nalukwago, 85th Vice Guild President at Macquarie University and also a student of Bachelors of Dental Surgery, Year 4. I am happy to be here and address some of the challenges the university students are facing. You see, according to the uh, survey that was done a week, uh, two weeks ago, that was published in Daily Monitor, it shows that 95% uh, of university students engage in uh, early sex. But uh, if that problem is there, what do we do? And uh, here we are faced with a problem of lockdown, where uh, students were sent back home. You know, a university or a school is an organized institution where sexual and reproductive health services can easily reach the students. So when they go back home, that becomes a challenge because most of our sexual and reproductive health uh, provisions, service provision in Uganda is done, it, it's, right now it's at 5%. And most of it is done by uh, civil society, not by government. So when you look at such a setting, this civil, civil society cannot easily access these students while they are back home if the government does not lend a hand. Even at university level, it's the same thing. When these students go back home, it is hard for these universities because many universities, for example, Macquarie, we have uh, services, uh, sexual reproductive services provided by the university. But when these students are home, it becomes hard for them to access these services. But uh, nevertheless, like we said, technology has come. I don't have to come to Kampala to be able to access the reproductive health services. But also technology has hindrances. When you look at the internet penetration of Uganda, it's at 37%. Electricity penetration is at uh, 28%. So what do we do? You see individuals cannot provide internet for the whole country, but the government can do that. You've seen that in developed countries. The government steps in and provides internet for the people. Um, when you look at our, um, the, the, the press conference, it was held back then around 2017 by the, by the former minister of ICT and said that the government is ready to step in and provide internet to all the Ugandan citizens, but that did materialize. But nevertheless, we encourage the government, we are students of universities because we are the youth and we are the, we are the biggest population in the country. We encourage the government to step in and provide internet because this is where we are going to. COVID-19 has set in and we are not sure whether it's going to end today, this year or in two years' time. It can go to as far as three years' time, like what Spanish flu did in 1918. 
So the government should step in and uh, provide better internet for the people. On top of that, electricity is very important. It may look at something not important because you people in the urban centers are accessing electricity, but remember, it's at 28% penetration in Uganda. That is really sad for the students. You know, when we are sent back home, not everyone lives in Kampala on the metro metropolitan business district. Most of the students actually here stay within deep in the villages. So if they don't have access to electricity, that means even access to internet is going to be a problem. Those are the problems we need to first ask, uh, address. Then we go on to how are we going to involve the civil society, even when they are already in, to be able to uh, give these services via internet, to give these services um, via different avenues. And also we as university students and also the university at large, you see when you bring these services in terms of lectures, it becomes boring. We as students know sometimes lectures are boring, that is the truth. But we can use different avenues of, sp of spreading sexual reproductive health services. One, we can use that, we have school of drama and performing arts, we can use those students to put these things in terms of drama, they, uh, they, their plays, their poems, entertainment. We students understand better when these things are brought in terms of entertainment because they are a little interesting and they are good to hear, they are good to our ears. So when you put it in a, rec uh, in a lecture setting, it becomes a little difficult for us to attain. So, um, and also on top of that, some of us have, have volunteer, I volunteered at Reproductive Health in my, P7, in my uh, Essex vacation. So one is also to encourage uh, our students, for example, in internship replacements, to go in some of these reproductive health uh, civil uh, society organizations that provide reproductive health services, so that they volunteer there. You know, the more people that are exposed to these services, that means when they go back home, they can expose them to the rest of the, of the people in their homes and young people and, and so on. So these young people will be able to uh, benefit. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you. I'll go to Professor Peace. Professor Peace, I know that you've been a scholar of issues SGBV and issues sexual harassment for quite some time. I do not know what you're reading into at this moment. I know that you've also published some research that you want to talk about. But what is the place of sexual harassment in the university, especially now that everything has become almost a privilege? Access to education is becoming a privilege more and more. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Actually, uh, we, we've, we've carried out a study before COVID lockdown, and we found in this study, rebuilding the moral infrastructure of the youth, we found that actually the, the, the university students are swimming in so many um, sexual abuses, they are swimming in so many evils. That, that are affecting them and are leading to sexual reproductive health uh, complications. Among these is sexual abuse, um, sexual harassment, rape, multiple partners, uh, unwanted pregnancy, abortion, all these they are facing. But one question I want to raise is that as researchers, as parents, we don't need to prescribe for the students for, for, uh, at the university because some of them face these challenges way back when they are still at home. And therefore, thinking that we are going to help them at the university may not be the appropriate intervention. We need to do studies to the young ones to find out what exactly do they want. Do they want to be exposed to these services or they want to be equipped with skills that can protect them, protect their sexuality, and have these cultural practices that we used to have where the, the, your sexuality is actually private, something that is not uh, supposed to be taken for granted and exposed. And therefore, uh, another uh, issue I see is that we need parenting courses to equip the parents, talk to their children about sexuality issues rather than waiting for the media, waiting for the researchers, waiting for others to tell them what they should do with their sexuality because we are not sure that this is what these young ones want. So I implore parents from the study that we conducted, the students were saying that for us, we've never had our parents tell us. So we get the information, who they tell us this wrong information and that's the information we go with. 
through secondary school to the university. So what if we, we talk to the children, not only talking to them, but talk with them, talk to them, and listen to them so that we get exactly how they want us to intervene, how they want us to protect them against uh, 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 these sexual uh, reproductive health issues, rather than us studying and we go there and say these are recommendations we are making in this room that the students that we should equip, give them uh, contraceptives or give them this and that or give them condoms. We need to listen to them and get it from that, that, that youth-centered, child-centered approach is very, very critical. But I also say we need to teach our children survival skills to negotiate and navigate around these issues. For example, the, the increasing sexual abuses that we are listening to on the radio, in the media, that it's, it's, it's too much. Even if you gave them condoms and whatever you want to give them, they are being defiled by their uncles, by the people they trust. So how far can we go by saying that we give them uh, contraceptives or condoms? Because they don't even know how they are going to run into these problems. So let us go back to the room. Uh, Professor Peace, I just want you to be more deliberate in responding to, for example, right now, people, especially they are calling them the finalists, have gone back to school. University is much more deserted than it's been before. There is a lot of appointments being done online. There is a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Do you see that this could be another risk to perpetuate further of these issues that you're talking about in this space and time? Yes, I agree with you. The, the risks, COVID has exacerbated the challenges that uh, our youth are facing, particularly the female students. I, um, from the way we are bringing them back to school, they, 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 where they pass, where they reside, all the eyes are on these young girls. And, and, and some of them are going to be taken advantage of because the parents, the caretakers who were supporting them financially have run out of business, have run out of jobs, and so they are at risk of falling into temptations and, and being vulnerable in, the, in, the, in that position. Yes, I agree with Okay, you. thank you. So I'll come back to Professor, and my question for you to ponder before I come back with Professor online as well is, what are the new areas of both research and for us who are working in civil society, for the government, what are some of those gray areas that we should now be thinking more about so that we can do research in them, focus programming as a way of addressing the come back to school after a whole most year of being home. So the two professors, I'd want you to focus on that. I'll go to the students in the room. What are the key turning points that come with COVID in your lives that you feel you've either managed or you'd want to manage better? Uh, I don't know if Martha is in class. I don't know if uh, my colleague Mary is also in class. What are some of those turning points in your lives that you think the people who are planning for university education should focus on now that COVID is something that we are living with? Yeah, so when COVID came in, um, to me, it occurred to me that one has to find something else to do instead of just focusing on books. So I think one of the things that can be put in place is killing the youth with other vocational service, other vocational skills like carpentry. You can be doing your degree, but there is something in place for you to get your hands on so that apart from you being locked down that maybe they've reduced workers at the place where you are working, you are able to sit home and get something to do with your hands and keep earning. This can be bakery, this can be crocheting, things like that, okay? And the other thing that occurred is we have to maybe get into farming as an extra skill we have at hand because you find that most youths take farming to be like something of the old age and somebody would sit home, be on their phone instead of maybe going to engage in the farming. 
So they feel like this is not for us. For us, we are in two books. So there should be something b to be done to integrate the youths into these other skills, apart from the books. That's the vocational skills, the farming skills, and any other skills that keeps them going. Because the COVID situation has shown us that one has to be empowered to move on, regardless of anything. You have to make sure that you, you have what to do with your hands to keep earning. You can, cause when it comes to internet, yes, you're at home, you are having the internet with you. Can you produce a product with your hands and sell it online? Like, can you be able to use internet to earn, to earn something? Because you understand that internet is something that you can use from home. So youths and other university students have to be engaged into this other side of thinking about life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think youth should be taught how to use uh, the media because the world is going digital. So we should learn how to use the different media platforms. Thank you. I'll go again at the student leader. Do you think the student leaderships in the different institutions of higher learning have a role to play? Do they have the structure? Can they do something to influence the direction COVID takes after school is open? Yes, I very much believe that the student leaderships in the different institutions of higher learning or even schools, secondary schools and primary schools, can do a lot. But this can only happen when this leadership is integrated into bodies like UNSA. But when you see such bodies not acting in this period, we get worried. Because these are the bodies that are supposed to be supporting students in this period. What can we do? Because um, these bodies, we are student leaders. We are supposed to be... Um, part of maybe of the, um, of, of, of the decision-making body because we know what has affected us as students and we can give um, some of the um, solutions to the problems we, that are affecting us. What I believe is, uh, one, we as a youth have been very much affected in this period. Why? Because most of us are not skilled. We saw m very everywhere in the world very many people or students when they went into lockdown, most of them became creative and innovative because of their education system. It helped them that during this redundant period, most of them were uh, brought out their skills and they did a lot for the country. But when you look at our education system that does not enable us, the youth, to be really well skilled, it brings in a question, how are we going to help the country? But we as leaders, we as student leaders, we are ready to help the government and other organizations that are willing to hear, to listen to us, to give them how with the youth and with the students of the country can benefit even when, the lo even when uh, COVID has been an evil, but we can turn it into something very good in one, skilling the human resource, especially as the youth. Like I said, since we are the biggest population in the country. Two, technology and innovation. This is the time we are supposed to be driven into technology and innovation. That is the use of media, the use of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, these di different platforms in the technology world so that one, we better our education, we better our skills, and we better our country in terms of human resource. Thank you very much. I'll go to the gentleman from Lida University. The next question will come to you after listening to Professor from Nairobi. What do you have to say about COVID and inclusion? Everything else, especially from Professor Osu's presentation, is pointing to the fact that education is becoming less accessible to many so people, especially the poor category of people. So speaking at a university like Lira University, which is in the countryside, I want you to speak more about inclusion. What are we going to do to make sure that we can include as many young people in tertiary education? Professor Osu, I'm coming back to you online to give us pointers of research, new programming in the face of returning young people to school after COVID. Professor. Thank you. I, I think there is a question we've been struggling with over the years, and I think this is the right time we need to answer it again. How can the education system make us not just employees of industry, but also agile and adaptable people who can fit in any situation? I think that's an, a question that um, needs to be answered as we go forward 
because we will continually get uh, these uh, difficult situations on and off in life, uh, like COVID. And so someone who has gone through a good education system should be adaptable and should be able to survive uh, these difficult moments. But how does the education system prepare us for that? One other thing that is worrying and we need to really work around uh, is um, right now, the science students and the, the ones that are arts-based, how do we make sure that none of them is left behind? I know someone is going to talk about inclusion. Because science-based courses are uh, more practical. Uh, so what do we do? How do we make it education integrated such that we can still have the virtual, but also the practical, it is not left out? What kind of graduates are we going to produce in medicine, in engineering, in agriculture, who are doing virtual classes? What can we do? to ensure that we are still producing uh, graduates who are um, um, quality and able to do their work. And finally, I would really want to bring in the issue of sexuality education. Um, I think we We lost mm -hmm. Professor. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the issue as we are talking about going internet, we are talking about home-based learning. The question that will come from this lecture, the professor will set a question which concerns this very last point that everyone else has not heard, and yet you are in the class. So these are the real issues. I'll go to professor regarding the pointers. I think you'd want to follow the line that professor also has set. Thank you very much. Um, I think as Professor Osu was saying, we need a curriculum review to begin looking at those subjects that are going to help the scholars to come out with skills to enable them to survive on their own. We also need to have a, a pedagogical uh, changes the way we teach. I look at how I used to teach before COVID and how I'm teaching now. Now I call the students on, on, on Zoom and I give them a question for them to do it and then we come and discuss. Previously I would come and pour out the knowledge that I have. But now they, that, they, that has to change. We must begin to look at the scholars as knowers, not as receivers of knowledge. Uh, we also, um, I'm also looking at uh, the areas of focus. We need to do research to look at those, uh, to do a cultural audit where uh, what are those cultural practices or good pra practices in our culture that can enable our students or young people to handle or address sexuality challenges among them. Secondly, we need to do a study on adult, adolescent centered studies to capture their interests uh, in, in avoiding uh, sexuality and reproductive health challenges rather than uh, prescribing for them. But we also need to rebuild the moral infrastructure, not only the youth, but also the children and the, uh, and the elders, so that what we are talking about is not treating the symptoms, but treating the root causes of all that we are facing. Because we know that the that, that, that root cause, if you don't treat the root cause, then symptoms will continue coming and you will not be uh, successful. Uh, we also need to equip the youth, like the youth are saying, with skills that are practical, that can help them navigate sexuality challenges. Some of the, our children, I know uh, at the university, some, some young men target the girls who are coming from uh, single-sex schools because they say they don't have skills to navigate and, and, and avoid. So we want to train our girls, young girls, to know that you can navigate these challenges which are common, but not only you. So if we can uh, uh, have a study that will give us ideas to equip our girls, young girls and young boys to navigate around these issues by themselves, that would be very, uh, very important and it will help our country to have a youthful, 
uh, a generation that has morals, values, and character to overcome any, any hurdles. Thank you. You know, as you mentioned, you talked about us going back to the parents, the old grandparents, CTC. But you know, COVID is a disease of social distancing. And specifically, COVID was saying, avoid the old people. Eh? <laughs> so, in practice, the younger people and the old people, the divide brought by COVID is actually going to grow. You know, I watched the, some of the very first documentaries which came from Kenya, where a family of one prominent person with 28 people, one died, another died, another, because they had all gone to the village. So the Minister of Health was saying, we told you, avoid the old people, avoid the villages, leave your parents alone. And you know, I hear that coming. So these are real challenges that we have to navigate even deeper because they are affecting the social fabric. After the gentleman from Ian Clark, that is, no, 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 that is Aleje. After Aleje has finished respond, I'm going to throw the microphone to the audience to also interact with this uh, panel of experts that we have here. Yeah, that's you, that's you, sorry a bit. Did I get it wrong? Who is Aleje? Aleje is him. Yes. So I was just announcing that after you, we shall also fall a bit to the audience. So please go on. We're talking about the issue of inclusion. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think that it's very important for us to understand how our COVID uh, causes. What we are seeing is that um, with the advent of COVID, we, first of all, make sure that they are prepared, you know, to, to, to handle like in my institution, they are doing a lot of uh, hand sanitizers, hand washing. Today I was. Thank you. So these students are more or less out of school. So what COVID has done is first of all to deprive the students the opportunity to have comprehensive sexuality education, both in the classroom and then through their peers. Uh, personally, I teach sexual and reproductive health as a course unit, and it's in those classrooms that I have the opportunity to interact with my students on different SRHR issues, and we have wonderful discussion. But now that opportunity is out of the roof is no more. And so COVID is causing exclusion in that way. Uh, secondly, when you look at now the online uh, distance um, uh, learning program, I don't think that people are giving a lot of priorities to other issues. You know, as a teacher, when you enter class, you have the core thing that you want to deliver in class, but then you have the extra issue that you bring on board and discuss with the, with the students. And some of the issues could be around uh, sexuality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. But now with the Odell, you have to be specific and on point and make sure that your students can first of all consume what you have. And so in that way, COVID has caused a big exclusion in our, in our communities. And so the question that I think I should answer now is how then do we make sure that we, we provide for inclusion even amid this COVID? First of all, I think that institutions must have affirmative action for resources designated for sexual and reproductive health and rights. If we talk about university hospitals, call them dispensaries, we must make sure that there's a budget line strictly to make sure that the services and commodities that pertain to sexual and reproductive health and rights are first of all there and those resources are not tampered with. That's the first bit. Now the other bit that we need to do as institutions we must make sure that uh, sexual and reproductive health education becomes a cross-cutting issue. You can imagine a student who has come to do engineering, okay? Do they ever have opportunity to, to have a formal lecture on sexual and reproductive health and rights? Or someone doing uh, um, music, dance, and drama? For them, that is what they came for. But we are saying that this is wrong because every young person needs information 
about sexual and reproductive health and rights. And so within every tertiary institution, we must make sure that we make SRH a cross-cutting issue, a cross-cutting cross across all faculties, across all uh, departments. And finally, as we embark on online distance e-learning, I think that institutions need to invest. Like one of the student leaders has already highlighted, these students come from a uh, poor background. They do not have access to internet. Okay, first of all, school fees is a family affair. Eh? The family has to contribute, the uncle, the auntie, and the student come. Now you're talking of internet bundle, which is very costly, by the way, in Uganda. And so we are saying that institutions must invest to create an enabling environment for the students in terms of internet access, first of all. Secondly, in terms of even the gadgets. If we talk about laptops, how many students have laptops in their institutions? Or a tablet, how many? Very few, possibly. And so for us to make sure that there is going to be continued inclusion, institutions must work towards creating an enabling environment for students to continually have uh, access to information and services relating to SRH uh, issues. I thank you. Yeah. This is a catch-22 in English. That's how they call it. For those of you who are watching the news and monitoring government, I was reading a memo from the Ministry of Internal Affairs that there is no more lunch to be served to the staff because government is broke. Now we are saying government should invest. <laughs> you know, this is catch-22 and it's quite complicated. I also heard from the presentation of Professor Osu talking about online and how we can make an online doctor, person who goes through medical school online and they're supposed to come and treat you <laughs> practically. So these are really the hurdles of our time. I want the audience to first give us some feedback. What questions do you have for this panel? Those are people managing high institutions of learning, a lecturer, a professor, and students, a student leader and other students. You want to give them your feedback? Maybe before you give them your feedback, I want to ask, what is the status of higher institutions of learning today? Are people at home, at school, or both? I would ask a person from Ian Clark, the private sector is always paying attention to the regulations. If anything happens, they are closed. Eh? All right, uh, you may allow me to. Okay, thank you, moderator. So what is happening is that uh, until about July, August, the National Council for Higher Education asked all universities across the country to apply and therefore be accredited or approved to do the what we call ODEL, um, open distance and e-learning. Now, as you're aware from the presidential directive, the students who are currently on campus are finalists. Okay? And so students who are in other classes have been allowed to go back to school, but you study from home, online. And this was, I think, right from October, when most of the universities were cleared. They were given one year between October, I mean, sorry, August this year and uh, October of, of next year, about a year. And so learning is happening, but it's happening online. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, skills or competence-based courses, because we also teach clinical, uh, we teach clinicians, we teach nurses, biomedical laboratory science. So what happens is that for the theory part of the course unit, you can do online, supported with other platforms for discussions and so on. But for practicals, even if you did simulations online, that cannot surface. So they will have to come at some point T. But what happens is that because of the SOPs, you don't bring them all at once. You bring them in batches, maybe of 10, because most of the skills labs are really not so huge. And therefore, you make sure that you maintain the social distancing. But actually, they must have competences derived from practical um, so uh, they, will not, they will not do surgery online? No, no. Yes, the audience that's can not, now ask. That's not possible. Thank Is you. Anyone who wants my mic? Oh, many people want my mic. I'll begin with the closest, and then I'll task them after that to move my mic. Yeah. Thank you so much, James, and uh, I want to thank the, the panelists. My name is Tony Mazira, Secretary of Productive Health and Rights. Yeah, so I'll start with a question. To know the status, I think she read my mind because uh, last week I read something during rights were that 45 students got COVID-19. Uh, 
that are finalists and others from other institutions. So I don't know how you people are handling in terms about COVID-19 and sexual, sexual reproductive health and rights, so we need to balance. Then secondly, uh, in terms of the, the output and the impact with the students, uh, and I, I really like uh, from my colleague who talked about you started SRHR in your, in your course unit. I did business administration, and now I'm an SRHR guru. So I think it starts also with the, with the passion from the students. Are they willing you know, to accept this and this? Because Uganda has made a record from May to August, we, are, we got about 6,000 teenage pregnancies. You know, I think that is something that we should learn from. And uh, I'm, it's really unfortunate that uh, Mr. Semakula has left out because I really wanted to hear about James about the policies in terms of policing. How are the institutions prepared to make sure that these policies are implemented? You know, in all other categories that the students are studying. You know. If I ask any of any student in this room, I'm finishing, to, to give you any SRHR aspect, few will be able to, you know, to give you it out. So I think it's important that most of the policies that have not been passed, like the school health policy, should be passed and implemented in all institutions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My name is Kaorona, a student at YCI. Um, when we talk about online studying, my question will go to the... Please stand up and speak into the microphone. My name is Kaorona, a student at YCI. When we talk about the online studying, my question will directly go to the lecturers and the professors within the building. Yeah, I'm not sure that all students who are from border districts are able to attain the online studying. Whereby, in Uganda, our network, we are not sure if it's very good, of which, even if we look at the, the Zoom process that we're going through with a professor from Kenya, Nairobi, it's very poor. We are not able to get some of the information that he's he is likely to give us. And when it comes to the students who are in such areas where the network is very poor, they are not going to be able to attain the education. So the lecturers and the professors within the building, how are you going to cater for those students who are not able to attain the education? And when they are allowed to return back to the institutions or higher schools, those are the secondaries, that's form four, form six, and form five and other classes. Are they going to be able Thank to you. get that Please pass knowledge? the mic. I think you've said your question. Just try to be brief. We're on TV. It's TV time, eh? Say your question and move on. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Nasuna Stella, and I'm a volunteer at Reproductive Health Uganda. I have three concerns. One, my first question was going direct to especially the private universities or institutes that because now if it's for the government institutes, they have, I mean, uh, the way the policies, the curriculum is so long, the procedure, but then for the private, like I said, have you tried to consider SRHR classes or interactions in your institutes? Two, like uh, the Guild said, the best way to handle youths or young people is through entertainment and kind of, and the best way I think we can achieve this, to me as a person out of research and interactions with young people is, even if you bring a senior woman or a senior man to talk to these people, they won't respond. These guys respond best to peers. So as institutes or higher learning uh, universities or institutes, uh, my suggestion is we, uh, we involve peers, we get peer educators, let them talk to their peers. I think it's one error or mistake. Many universities do that to really handle uh, SRHR. Then lastly, there are some institutes that have a policy, once you get pregnant, you're disqualified. My question is, is this going to happen? Because 
it is now not even research, but it's proof that many young girls have gotten pregnant. So as you leaders in the higher institutions of learning, are you still going to go on with a policy of you? You know you've come back pregnant, please stay home. Or you are planning on revising that? Thank you, Nasuna. We could have some of those responded to as we move the mic. Yes. Who wants to go first? Try to label your questions to people so that it's easy to allocate. The gentleman from the very first. You, yes. Um, YMCA does not uh, expel students who are pregnant, but it does not at the same time encourage students to become pregnant when they are still in their active days of study because it inconveniences them. I think this is a policy which most universities also hold. I'm not saying all. So I would encourage other universities to allow the young students, to allow the young men and the, the, the young ladies to finish their studies, despite the fact that they have become pregnant. However, to the students, we encourage you, you can wait for a while, finish your studies, finish your three, five years, then you become pregnant, get married and become pregnant. Um, maybe I can answer one more. Uh, Ms. Nasuna, you asked how we handle the SHRS uh, issues in the Institute of Higher Learning. These programs are there, but like the classroom programs, which have also been affected by COVID, it is now hard. Airtime is expensive. Students want to go online to pick exactly what they want to hear, and then they are off. So we, we upload to make sure that they spend as little as possible. And they listen more to their peers. How do we extend these services? We have been extending these services through MDD, through sports, and through dialogues like this where we invite uh, the informed like you, and they talk to them on a regular basis in uh, assemblies and seminars and ETC. This, I think, as universities and institutes of higher learning, we should now start thinking more to see that this information still goes to them. It's starting with what they have in place. We are developing platforms to educate them, but they are already having social media platforms which they are comfortable with. Let us encourage them also and we pass on this information so that they are not left out because we need to receive them back well uh, when they return at any point when they will Thank be you, sir. allowed back. Thank you. You want to take one? Thank you, moderator. Uh, very quickly, uh, what are we doing in the universities? I'll use our example and probably other will share their own experiences. So, yes, we are very concerned about young people. So apart from reproductive health being in the curriculum as a course unit, we've deliberately come up with uh, activities. And uh, I, I want to approach it this way, that as students, don't just look at management, the university as the, the end, and therefore everything must be done, must be done by the university. It should be a partnership. For instance, I'll tell you that because of the nature of our courses, even if you introduce clubs, students will tell you we are busy. We are busy, we don't have time for extracurricular activities. That means, it is a challenge for you, the students, to deliberately develop the interest to belong to a club, such as a reproductive health club. I'll give you an example, and I am very confident to talk about them. Public Health Ambassadors, Uganda. I think many of you, and probably they will have partnered with... Uh, we know them very exactly. well. Exactly. So that was a young group that I personally mentored. I am not blowing my own trumpet. Patrick Segawa, if he was here, he would uh, give a testimony to that. We mentored them to start a club. It was a dance, drama... Salsa, it was a salsa group. I am not a dancer, but I saw that they would uh, turn that from a behavioral science point of view into communicating magnet theater, for instance. As we speak now, it is a very big a national organization that is uh, actually reaching out to young people. Public, you can Google out and check out what they are doing. And that, that is just to show evidence, to give you evidence that uh, something is happening. Um, I just wanted to respond to the young lady who asked about people in the border districts where there's no 
um, internet and so on. So what you know, some universities have gone to do, including us, is uh, apart from the digital, we also make provision for hard copies and uh, content stored on either stick or whichever memory, and you find a way of accessing this or we send it over to you. So we've not only limited it online so that we don't leave you behind. I remember we were talking about inclusion. Thank you very much. Yes, my brother from Lira University. Um, so I, I'm, I'm first of all so happy that uh, we are talking about sexuality. People have uh, sort of a, a narrow perspective of what it entails. Okay, when you talk about sexuality, there are many uh, components. Sexual health and reproduction. And then we talk about like uh, sensuality. And all these are things that we must put into perspective if we are going to offer information and services that are appropriate. Now, universities are almost same autonomous. Okay? They have capacity to, to, to make their own policies that are functional. And so personally, it bothers me that universe, some universities do not have written policies on important issues, for instance, education policy for, for student mothers. And so we leave most of these things to um, individual biases and subjective um, interpretation of things, which actually endangers our students. I personally don't think that getting pregnant is necessarily a problem. That's not, that's not a problem because there is, there is way more life after, after pregnancy. You understand? And until we begin to see some of these thing, things through the positive lens, and we put in place appropriate mechanisms to protect these students and make them experience um, the consequences of their action in a safe environment, then we are not going to reap the, 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 the dividends, the benefits of, 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 of these things among us, among us the peers. Okay? I don't think that, for instance, a student who comes to, to, to class and seeing a colleague pregnant would necessarily immediately wish to get pregnant. On the contrary, I think that they learn more from their colleague and the, you know, the challenges that they're going through and how they're coping with this whole thing. And so what I'm trying to say, bottom line, that I think that universities must have clear policies on re-engagement of students, okay, or when they get pregnant. And for, 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 for the better part, we are advocating for a continuation of policies, policies that give these students uh, freedom to enter school at any time they, they want, even when they're pregnant. Thank you. As I go back to the audience, I'll go and leave a question with Professor Peace. Professor Peace, we talk of multi-sector approach to respond to such big things that are not anyone's business, which are so big for an individual. What does multi-sector approach, what does multi-sector support mean to higher institutions of learning in the face of COVID? Which support do you need from who do you need it? You're going to have a last say on that and your national TV and your professor. So, take your time. Yes, I saw the microphone somewhere here, please. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, Joanita Kahunde. Um, I'm a student here at MOOC and a volunteer at Reproductive Health. My concern is someone said they have discovered that most of the of the girls at university are pregnant. What are our universities doing about it, even the lecturers? I feel like lecturers should spare some time in lectures and actually talk to, to the students about sexuality, which is not done. And then, um, I heard you say there is a sexuality course unit in university. I've been at MOOC, there is nothing like that. Thank you, Joan. You could pass the mic. I'll also go to the students that we have in the room. I know students always want to talk to, is it government or parents? Whom do you prefer to talk to? Both. Just tell me. Both. Government or parents? Both. 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 Okay. I want you to, in a few minutes, craft a message. As you go back to school, I know that learning is taking place, like they have just rightly said, people are learning. You know, when they say learning is taking place online, I am 
at a very high level of employment, I work, I earn money. Many times I have failed to access meetings when my internet is postpaid, very assured I'm in a place like this one, and I drop off a meeting and I can't do much. So when someone says people are learning and they're from all over the country, I really feel pained. So as students and student leaders, can you pass a message? What can be done to make sure that those who are struggling with this learning, what can we do for them after this whole lockdown is done and maybe something better comes up? Talk about that, right? What do you want us to do? Thank you. Who has the microphone beside? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Akoth Anna, and I'm a student at YMCA. Uh, my concern is how is the education sector and the health sector tracking progress? Uh, when I talk of the education sector, I'm looking at the finalists, handling our whole semester's work within the shortest time possible. I mean, it's what is happening in Uganda. We have, uh, like, when you to look at the universities, most of them are around town. And what is happening is that tear gas and all that, so students are not really focusing. So what is the government in line with the education department doing? Uh, when I come to the health, this the time, the target time, like for you to meet and talk to the students. Few of them are in, are in school, mostly the the finalists. This would be the appropriate time to meet and exhort and encourage, talk about, uh, talk to them and listen to them. I believe this uh, would be the appropriate time to implement or to meet the students and talk about them. So I want to know what are you planning? Because the students are there, they're available. You see them go to town when Tiaga starts there. I mean, you see them going to school when chaos starts, everyone is running home. What are you doing to encourage and see that we are stable in school? Uh, thank you very much. Um, happen to be a journalist with a new vision. At the same time, I happen to be a student at Islamic University in Uganda, pursuing law. Um, I think uh, at IUIU, it's one of the universities that have got stringent terms to issues to students getting pregnant and what have you. But um, in my opinion, I believe we are missing out one aspect of the economic impact in all of this. I've met several students who are trying to earn a living and end up getting pregnant and, and we need really to also include this discussion in whatever we are doing. It shouldn't be not only that because of COVID, there are a lot of factors that really leads to the violation of the, of the right to sexuality. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'll go back to the lecturers on this side of the table. And in your last packaged message, I would want you to talk to parents. You are the lecturers. You live in the universities. You know what is happening there. How can parents be involved in this? What can they do to make the learning experience post-lockdown? more meaningful. So I'll go to the professor first, as promised. I am here. Thank you very much, moderator. You asked about the multi-sectoral multi approach that can be used. I'll use an example of Makere University. Um, we have the government supporting uh, in innovations. Recently, government funded uh, research where among the research we have key uh, sexual harassment out of the university and that project was launched to support and to support the, the, the students. We also have another research which I conducted uh, that came up with an innovation called Becoming a New Generation with Moral Values and Character and, and we have 
uh, groups of, of students, clubs in each college that's 10 and that is uh, we also partnered with uh, Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development because they also have innovations. We have other uh, Uganda Women's Network where I'm a board member. We also partnered with them to come up with you know, interventions that can uh, not only uh, deal with exclusion, is, uh, in exclusion, but also to support the girls and uh, female and male students. But we have also gender mainstreaming division, which also has peer trainers uh, where the students are encouraged to, be, to group themselves and educate uh, the, the other students. And uh, also the university management, we have a sexual harassment policy, which is protecting uh, mostly uh, female students against sex for marks, which professor, you have read professor, about. Professor, professor, you're going to give me a whole thesis, but <laughs> I just want you to be spot on. You know, I have followed, for example, a lot the current Archbishop of the Church of Uganda and his messaging around many of these things. I would want you, in your capacity, to speak to some of these people that have the power to influence things and exactly what you'd want them to do. Yeah. Um, in short, I would like the government, the, the, univers the institutions, uh, the parents, and the uh, relevant ministries to partner and come up with interventions that will enable uh, female and male students, uh, youth, to work together again uh, to navigate around the challenges of sexual sexuality uh, issues. Okay. Thank you, Professor. I'm sorry that I had to stop you from going the long way. Yes, my friend Maria. Um, Mercy. I'm Mercy. So as we students, we are tasked to talk about what the government and the parents can do to help students in their online studies, right? So I think the institutions can think of lowering the internet or funding it so that students are able to attend their online classes. So they talk to the internet providers and find a way of an agreement so that something can be done to lower the internet charges or, because for me, from my experience, if you are to have a Zoom meeting, first of all, it depends on the time. A normal long Zoom meeting can take like 300 MBs, right? So if you are to have three Zoom meetings in a day, that means you have to use 900 MBs. So something can be done in discussion with the in institution so that maybe we have shorter classes maybe one class a day so that a student can be able to handle that one class for that day and budget for those few MBs and make sure that they are able to attend that class that day and another day, another class, instead of having to have three classes in a day and then you miss out the two and you only attend one. Also, it something can be done on breaking up the course units. For example, if I had to handle eight course, eight course units in a semester, I can handle four instead of the eight so that I can be able to spend on these four course units instead of the eight. So that can come with the discussions of the higher management in the universities, with the government and all the stakeholders holders involved. The other thing can be lowering the tuition so that if you are to pay maybe 200 M for your course, you can maybe pay 1.5 and the 500 Ugandan shillings can cater for your internet studies. Thank you. I'll go to Martha. Thank yeah, you. My, mine goes to parents. I think they should monitor their, their kids' um, progress in school. They should also provide their children with, with internet for their coursework and their Zoom meetings. Then the government should also provide laptops to every student. People who are campaigning, I hope you have heard, the young people want laptops for every student. In the interest of time, I'll first leave out to the lecturers because I believe you've said most of what you want to say and go to the student leader. From there, I'm going to ask someone from Reproductive Health Uganda and then UNESCO to close this meeting. So please. 
Um, thank you very much. Uh, one thing I would like to, to put across is that on 21st October, the guild leadership of different universities, including me, we went to the speak of parliament and addressed a petition on the online studies. And some of the issues we addressed was the feasibility of the online studies on the current status quo of Uganda. Because like I gave you statistics of the online pen, of the internet penetration, the electricity penetration, which do not favor the online studies. But nevertheless, um, I think the petition did not materialize. Uh, I, I, I don't think the, the, our political class is more interested in our education. That is what I thought as a person. Because the issues we gave were very pertinent. One, one of the things we addressed is decrease of tuition. She talked about it. Even for online studies elsewhere in the world, a person doing an online course does not pay the same money as a person doing physical course. Because the online course is more uh, financially straining on the student than the institution. So one of the things to address is, one, decrease the tuition to half. That is when the online studies will go on well. Number two is putting up zero-rated online stud uh, studying platforms. That also helps the students. This, this can be done by the universities and the government. That also helps the students to get the urge to log into those online platforms and continue with their studies. Number two is um, uh, government should give a stimulus package. You know institutions, we, we really understand that institutions of higher learning, even schools, they run mostly on tuition paid by students. So if the students don't pay tuition, obviously the institutions are not going to run. Even during the lockdown when we were at home, these institutions were running, they were paying electricity bills, they are paying water, but that money comes from students. But we are saying that these students are going to pay half. Where will the rest of the money come from? The government should give them stimulus packages. Like we've seen the government giving stimulus packages to artists, to uh, different people. They can also give our education sector because the education se sector is responsible for building human resource. Number, th uh, number three or four, uh, okay, so student employment bureaus. Maybe the last. Student employment bureaus. We know that students have to pay tuition. That one we understand. There can never be entirely free education. But the universities can put up student employment bureaus. We have secretaries at different colleges of the university. We can say, let, let us reserve those positions for students. Because some students work do, uh, study during evening hours. But we can say those, those, those slots, let them be for students. When the salary comes, we cut half of it and put it to tuition. Those are some of the ways we can help students. And lastly, if the government is committed to helping students in online studies, honestly speaking, OTT should not be standing at this time. OTT. 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 Okay, OTT should go. Thank you very much, yes. my guild health minister. I'll now ask Richard from Reproductive Health Uganda on behalf of the ED to come and help us close, but also recognize a very important visitor. We have Mr. Y. Plus. Mr. Y. Plus. Is going to be recognized by the ED. Please, Richard. I hope you know who Mr. Y plus is. Richard, it's your time. Charles, I hope you'll be ready just after Richard. Our few minutes of fame on air are about to get done. Most welcome, sir. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, James, and uh, the organizers, and of course the students, the lecturers, um, and everyone, and of course the participants. The participants, we appreciate, uh, and the team here from the ministry, from Reproductive Health Uganda, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, two things to close, and then in, uh, recognize uh, Miss Personality? Y plus. Okay, the names are confusing. Uh, so I apologize for that. But I, I think we've had it. And I, I think that the message to the government, I think it's, it's been clear from the students, from the lecturers, from everyone, uh, each one of us. And for me, I would want to say that, uh, yeah, some of the things I think are, are, are to the government and the, even to the parents, to the decision makers, I think maybe one of the things that uh, we need to know, uh, maybe we need to agree that the end and the facts on the ground should justify the means. So whatever we do, whatever we want to take on, what are the facts on the ground and what, what do we want to achieve? 
So let's, let us put uh, the inputs or the decisions we make, not, we shouldn't be taken up by our the religious backgrounds, emotions, or culture emotions, and because the challenge in this country is that we are so, so much influenced by religion and culture that are not helping this country to move to another step. I think we need to, yeah, uh, uh, we need to recognize that even the parents and I think even us, culture and religion, they are good, but they, is, they shouldn't be that the at most uh, uh, influencers of making certain critical decisions. I mean, a decision like using contraceptives, use, uh, allowing uh, 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 contraceptives in the universities and the high institutions of learning, or our young people using contraceptives. Should it be, uh, should the religion and the culture overshadow that decision? Yeah, I think for me, that's what I would, uh, I would say. And uh, let me, I need to consult, apologies. Okay, yeah, I have now been given the, the title. I, I didn't know the title. Uh, we want to, yesterday, of course, we had uh, 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 an event organized by uh, UNEPA at Serena. And uh, yeah, I, I wasn't there, but I had over uh, the news it was there. And uh, we, had, we have Mr. Y Plus in our midst. So we are going to, we are, I'm inviting Mr. Y Plus to say something to us. Uh, Mr. Y Plus. You can come and say a word to us, and of course we see you, we recognize you. Otherwise, thank you so much, participants. Thank you so much, for, uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Wienza. Thank you so much, uh, the, panel, the uh, panelists. And uh, thank you so much, the organizers and the MCs. Thank you very much, Richard, on behalf of RHU. We shall give Miss Y plus one minute to tell us who they are and what they do. And after that, please hand over the mic to Mr. Charles Drachebo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Nachedre Catherine, um, Miss Y Plus Central. Nationals, I am with a Miss Personality. This is a pageant called the Y Plus Beauty Pageant, organized by an organization called Uganda Network of Young People Living with HIV. It connects all the youths that are living with HIV and we are fighting the discrimination and stigma amongst these young people. And we have noticed that the young people are taking lead in this. They are fighting it more than the doctors or the counselors because the young people really understand fellow young people. And uh, I'm also a student at YMCA. So there's something that was mentioned here. And um, as a sole supplement, I would really love to see that they could engage these peers because it has really surfaced that it is even true that peers really associate so much with our peers. And there's great results in that. Thank you, Thank you very you much, so much, Ms. Nachejo. I'll right now ask Charles to be very brief as our minutes of fame run so fast and close for us this meeting on behalf of the team at UNESCO. Thank you very much, James, and thank you very much, the colleagues. It's been a pleasure for me to be part of this very important occasion where we've been having a dialogue in the university dialogue focusing on COVID-19 and sexual reproductive health and rights in higher learning institutions amid the uncertainties. I would like to start by thanking Reproductive Health Uganda for taking this responsibility and initiative for bringing the students together to dialogue on this very important issue. I also want to thank the university administration of Makere University to host this. We also have uh, the Ministry of Education and Sports that was ably represented here, and all the stakeholders, the students who have been online, and also those who are present here. On this very occasion, I will not have much to say, but having sat here for all this time, I think there are a few messages that we would like to take home in terms of what I will consider to be principles. I think having listened to this dialogue, to me, six things stand out clearly as principle. One is that leave no one behind. 
leaving no one behind means there has to be inclusion and equity in whatever we are doing. For people of all categories, those who are not able to access sexual productive health services because of their condition or location should not be left behind. That's number one. Number two, there's been a focus on promoting life skills and livelihood as an alternative way of, for young people to cope with situations that will otherwise compromise their reproductive health. So we need to look at how to provide gainful employment opportunities and how life young people can adapt to skills that are relevant to make them to be productive in life. Thirdly, these approaches need to be multi-sectoral. It's not only education, because education can provide for you the skill, but then the health needs to provide you the services. So, and, and, and then in the community, we are dealing with the religious leaders, we are dealing with cultural leaders, parents, and every stakeholder needs to be brought on board in order to allow this to be very successful. And then number four, it has to be innovative. I think this has been said again and again in effort to ensure that we cope with the situation, especially COVID-19 has shown us the way we can do things differently in the situation that are different crises. How will we have managed transmitting information on sexual productive health in a situation of COVID if we were not able to do social media, for example? How can we use performing artists? How can we use music in order to communicate messages? That's the innovation. And then number five, we need to blend policy with implementation. At the global level, at the regional level, at the county level, we are not short of policies. I think what we are emphasizing as UN is that we need to ensure that there's a blend between what the policy says and what is practical, especially if you are to reach young people with quality, sexuality, education, and information. And lastly, but not least, the young people have to be at the center of this. If it's not for the young people, if it's not with the young people, then it cannot be for the young people. So I recognize all the young people here, and I would like to congratulate the, the Y Plus initiative under the UNIPA for the efforts that they are taking to fight stigma. And mine was a humble one to give you a closing remark, and I think with those principles, I'm very, very honored on behalf of the organizing committee and for those who have invited me to give this remark, and I thank you very much for participating, and I will encourage all of us to stay well and to stay safe. Please, let's observe the SOPs. COVID is still with us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Charles Drachebo, Principal Officer for UNESCO in Uganda. Yes, we've had a very fruitful discussion this morning, and we've been live on NTV.